Who's ever heard of the term a, a, a locomotive train? Who's ever heard that before? A locomotive train. Well, what I didn't know, I only found out discovered. What a, 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 a locomotive is not a train. A locomotive is actually the power unit or the engine of a type of train. And this, 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 some of these trains, they, they can go as, uh, like, they, they can be as long as two miles. Think about that, two miles of train. And, and they are so powerful, they can pull uh, uh, cars across entire countries, and it can be loaded with coal and oil and lumber and all manner of heavy cargo. And they're able to pull two miles of all this cargo up uh, hills and, and uh, through mountain passes and all over all manner of terrain. And it almost seems like nothing can stop this locomotive train. It's, it has sheer power. It's, it's, it's focusing them and it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's going in a certain direction. Um, and its strength um, is upon two narrow rails, uh, which results in mechanisms uh, that accomplish tremendous things. Powerful, powerful, powerful piece of, of ingenuity and creation of man. But do you know what can render a locomotive completely ineffective? This powerful train. It is when this powerful train comes off track. That the moment it comes off track, this train cannot do nothing, nor can it go anywhere that it is so powerful, it can, it can move thousands of tons and, and two miles of things all across the country. But the moment it comes off track, despite its great power, it cannot, it is unable to do anything, even move itself. In fact, it can't even go inch forward. And so it's, impo imp imp it's important that it returns back on track so it, it, could, it could accomplish the purpose of which it was intended. This morning, we want to look at one of the powerhouses of the word of God. And this man has gone off track. And it is important he gets back on track so he can accomplish the purpose for which he was intended. I want to preach a sermon I've called Back on Track. And I want God to speak to us about getting back on track. Because in this church, there's some powerhouses in the kingdom of God. There's some people right now, you're listening, understand my voice, you are a powerhouse of the kingdom of God, but maybe you're just off track a bit. And God wants to get you back on track like he did our brother we're going to look at this morning. Genesis chapter 35, verse 1 to verse 7. The Bible says, then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people were with him. And he built an altar, verse 7, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Can we pray this morning? Father, we love you. We thank you right now, Father, for this time in your presence. God, we are asking a visitation of the Holy Spirit this morning. Holy Spirit, this is your church. And I'm asking God, you would meet with precious men and women that you have redeemed. In fact, you have called by name and they are yours. I'm asking this morning, God, there'll be a realignment. I pray there'll be a reconnection. I pray, God, that you would visit us in this place. Father, we ask for anyone who is 
backslidden. We ask for anyone who is lost. Father, save them, God. Bring them back home. Father, we commit this time to you. We give you our undivided attention. Jesus, have your way this morning. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. In the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, and all of God's people said, amen and amen. I want to consider this morning when you are off track. When you are off track. Genesis chapter 34. This is before Genesis chapter 35. Genesis chapter 34 has been called a godless chapter. And the reason it is called a godless chapter is because for the whole chapter, God is not mentioned. God is not seen. God, you can say, is not active. Amen. You can say this morning, church, that God is absent by name and also in principle. And because of this, it is a chapter that is filled with deceit. It is filled with lust. It is filled with murder. It is filled with shame and all manner of madness. And church, it is all because of a man, a father, a husband, has gone off track. His name is Jacob tonight. Jacob is a man that God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Jacob the schemer, Jacob the gangster, Jacob the liar, and then becomes Israel, a man, the prince who prevails with God. God changed his name this morning. And here is a man, sadly, even though God changed his name, he lived like he was never changed. Listen, one of the tragedies of Christianity this morning is when some of God's people live like they have never been changed, that you have never been touched by God. That you've never been visited amen, by heaven this morning. And here he is this morning. This is man. It was by his family that the nations of the world was to be blessed. It was by his family that a nation was going to be birthed and come into the world. And through that family, the world was going to be blessed. Amen. By the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here is a man that meets with God. Here is a man that received the promises of God. Here is a man that's walking at one point in the grace of God. But as we find him in our text, church, he's completely off off track. God had met with him in chapter 31 and tells him, I want you to go back home. I want you to go to where after we had a conversation about where we promised that we were going to meet. And Jacob is on his way home. And the Bible tells us I mean, things are fixed with him and his brother I mean, that he had a problem with because he meets with him and things are fixed. But on that way home, he takes a detour to a place called Shechem and he's there for seven to eight years. And so so much happened in Shechem. His own daughter was raped at Shechem. His sons, amen, retaliated by, you can almost say, man, a, a genocide or overkill where they don't just kill the men who raped um, his their sister. They killed every man of that place in Shechem. And because of this, amen, it caused them to live in fear because all the other places around them began to hate them, began to despise them, began to plot and say, we hate these people. We can't stand these people. How did they come here and do these things, you know, we're going to take them out, we're going to wipe them from the face of the earth, and now they're living in fear, and I want you to think about it this morning, church, a page in his life was written when it did not have to be written. See, his life is off track, and I really wish that was only the only case of this, but it's not. The Bible speaks about a man in the book of Judges 14 called Samson. Samson is a strong man deliverer who was to bring deliverance to the people of God, but he himself needed deliverance. Samson was a man, you can say, he was a stronger man that had a weakness for weak women. And he's always around the wrong places. And he's always chasing them in the wrong women. And he's always a man around the, a man ungodly women and hanging around ungodly places. You can say this morning, Samson went off track. We can talk this morning about the prodigal son, that he comes to his father and tells him to give me my inheritance. In other words, dad, I wish that you were dead. And here is a man, in fact, I'm going to pause and say this. Here is a good father that had two bad sons that went off track. And I'm going to say this morning, there are some very, very good parents in this building right now. Can I encourage you this morning? Do not beat yourself over the head because of the bad decision of your children. It's so sad, man, that many times good parents, you've tried your best, you're doing the best you can, you're trying to put them on the right track, you're trying to get them in the right place, but man, they, listen, they're getting older, they're making their own decisions, and they're making some foolish choices, and we begin to big ourselves ahead, maybe this, maybe that, maybe this, maybe that, don't beat your head, yourself over the head, man, because of the decisions that they're making this morning, but I will say this, regardless of who you are, 
God would allow you to reap the consequences of your disobedience. In chapter 34, we see, the verses, we see this happening. It is a complete mess. It is, it is horrible. It is dark. It is, it, is, it is ugly this morning. But I thank God so much that, listen to me, that some chapters end and new chapters begin. Because, listen to me, church, when it seems like we mess up, God knows how to show up. When we see that man, we just we just we destroyed the whole thing. It is then that God decides, uh, Amen. He's going to come in uh, and in, in He almost uh, uh, inserts Himself uh, because in the verse, very first verse, uh, I mean, of chapter thirty-five, uh, after all the madness, uh, after Dinah has been raped, uh, after Levi, uh, Amen, and Simeon, uh, Amen, go on a killing spree, uh, Amen. After uh, Jacob, uh, he's only thinking about himself uh, and not about his family, not about his God. After all that madness is taking place, uh, after Amen, he's making money and making alignments uh, or a uh, 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 linking amen with ungodly people uh, amen after all this madness in chapter uh, 35 verse 1 the bible says then god listen to me this morning church there is no god in chapter 34 just flesh and this morning amen you are in the wrong place spiritually when there is no god attached to your life you are in the wrong place spiritually when there's no God attached to your choices and decisions. Listen, I don't care how much money you're making. I don't care who likes you. I don't care how healthy you are. Listen, if you are not riding with God, you are riding to a very dangerous place. And this is where we find Jacob. He's in a very dangerous place. His life is a mess. Things have come to a head, and all oh, with the grace of God, the Bible says, then God said. Listen, why does God show up when you and I don't acknowledge him? Because he's trying to get us back on track. Here's the thing, listen. Every single one of us, whether we like it or not, we are on a track. It just depends what track we're on. We're even on the right track or the wrong track. We're even on our track or we are on God's track. We are on a track this morning. And God shows up your life and my life because he's trying to get us back on track. So let's consider getting back on track. Because here it is. If we are going to get back on track, it's going to involve the church. Let me say that again, because I know everyone liked that. If we're going to get back on track again, it is going to involve the church. God speaks to Jacob and says, Jacob, go to Bethel. We sang that song this morning in Psalms 122, believe it or not. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into what? The house of the Lord. The psalmist continues in Psalms 84 verse 10. David said these words, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tent of wickedness. That I'd rather be, amen, have one of the lowest jobs in the house of God than to dwell tent that is flourishing with all manner of wickedness. I don't know how many of you, man, how many of you have ever seen unsaved people and you wanted what they had? Right? You, you see, listen, you see people, they're not saved and, and they, you look at what they have, you say, I want that. And I know you're all saved and you're too holy, but I, I would have been in it. I, I've looked at some unsaved people. I say, I want, I want, I want that, man. Boy, <laughs> I could do with some of that. And if you listen, you, you may not join me this morning, but there's a man called Asaph who enjoy, who, who joins with me. In fact, you can read him and his account in Psalm 73. In Psalm 73, amen, he's looking at him, amen, and the Bible tells us uh, he's looking at, at, at all the wickedness that's going on. Uh, he's looking at him and all the madness is happening. Uh, and he says, you know what? I was envious of the wicked. Uh, I'm seeing wicked and ungodly people. Uh, it seems like they're getting jobs when I'm losing my job. Uh, I'm seeing wicked and ungodly people. Uh, it seems like they get into good relationships uh, when I have no relationship. Uh, it seems like wicked and ungodly people, uh, they have money in the bank when I'm completely broke. Uh, it seems like wicked and ungodly 
ungodly people, they're happy and I'm sad and I'm, uh, and I'm depressed. It seems that wicked and ungodly people uh, have amen, things happening for them uh, and I think that things are being taken away from me. And, it's, uh, and he tells us uh, that, you know what, I looked up and I was envious at the prosperity of the wicked. They are prospering, they're doing good, they're doing well. Uh, and maybe in his mind, he said, you know what, uh, maybe this God thing is a waste of time. Maybe this God thing is a long thing. Maybe this God thing, why am I giving myself to God? Why am I living clean? Why am I praying? Why am I believing? And it seems like my prayers are jumping on the unrighteous and I, here I am, I'm righteous and nothing good is happening to me. And he's making this complaint to God in Psalm 73 at the very beginning. But at the end of it, in Psalm 73 verse 17, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, that I understood their end. He said, listen, I, listen, I was nearby about to backslide. Then I went to church and I heard preaching and God showed me the end of these people's lives. And I said, no, 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 God, I'm hanging with you. God, I'm staying with you. See, he did not get that revelation until he went to church. Jesus says, my house shall be called what? A house of prayer. Paul, who many people believe, wrote the book of Hebrews, tells us not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together, as some are, especially as we see the day approaching. Why am I saying this? Throughout the word of God, there is a high view of the church. And listen to me, if we call ourselves the people of God, that ought to be our view as well. We ought to, amen, elevate and lift up, amen, the church of Jesus Christ. Because, listen, I thought about it. I don't know where my life would be right now without the church. I have no idea. I, mean, yeah, I tell people I could be dead. Listen, it could be worse. I could be, I mean, wrapped up, amen, uh, uh, in a white jacket, uh, uh, completely lost my mind. I could be, I could be, I could, I could be involved in an accident. Uh, I mean, I can't uh, remember anybody. I can't say that I'm a complete vegetable. I mean, I, 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 could, I could be, I mean, sold as a, a slave in another country. It could, so my, we have no idea where we'll be without the church. Why is this important? Because Jacob was last at Bethel in Genesis 28. See, like many of us, he was in trouble. And he was running. He was running from his father because he lied to his father. He was running for his brother because he had ripped off his brother. His brother wanted to kill him. He's running because he's in trouble. And guess what? He runs in the church. He comes to this place called Bethel. And Bethel simply means house of God. And it is there he meets with God. It is there he communes with God. It is there he receives the promises of God. It is there he becomes a tither. He says, God, of everything I get, I'm going to give a tenth. I'm going to give 10% to you. It is there he commits with God. It is there God speaks to him and he, he speaks back to God. There is this powerful interaction taking place in Bethel. There is this powerful thing taking place in the house of God. But in Genesis 35, amen, over 20 years has passed. Since this man went to Bethel, and things have changed, he's not single anymore. He's married. He has some kids. He's, 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 not, he's, not, he's not broke anymore. Because in Genesis 38, 28, he was broke. He was so broke, he had to use the stone as a pillow. Some of us, amen, we've got some very good pillows. But no, no, there's nobody here using a stone as a pillow. That's how broke this guy was. He's using a stone as a pillow. But listen to me, right now, amen, in Genesis 35, amen, he's blessed uh, uh, materially. Uh, uh, things have happened in uh, uh, the, the, the beef he had with his brother Esau has been squashed a long time ago. It is a far cry from the man who says, God, if you get me away from all this drama, God, if you rescue me from all this foolishness, God, listen, hey, God, I'm going to serve you. Hey, God, I'm going to do your, I'm going to be the house of God. Hey, God, hey, far cry from that day. Now, if you know your Bible, I want to ask you a question. Did God keep his promise to Jacob? Yes or no? Yes, he did. God promised him in Genesis 28, he says, listen, 
You serve me. You do my will. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless you. In fact, he begins to speak over his life. He says, listen, Jacob, you are of biblical royalty. I know your grandfather, Abraham. I know your father, Isaac. And I'm going to know you as well. Through you, the nations are going to be blessed. I'm going to bring you back in this place. I'm going to make sure you prosper. I'm going to make sure nobody messes with you. You're going to be good as long as you stay with me. God is speaking these things. You know, and Jacob is speaking back. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to do all these things. And God kept his promise. Here's the question. When are you and I going to start doing the same? Because God kept his part of the bargain. See, Bethel is more than a physical location. Going to Bethel is not always geographical because we're here right now. It's far much more than coming to 551B High Road. And we need to grasp that. It's deeper than that. You say, what do I mean? Do you remember when you wouldn't miss a service for anything? But now. Do, do, you, do you remember when, 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 do you remember when you, you would not be late to church for anything? And when you weren't late, you beat yourself over the head? But now, well, you know what? Better late than never. And it's not an issue of traffic. It's not an issue of somebody was obstructing you for coming. Do, do, do you remember, do you remember, do you remember when, 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 you, 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 when, when there was an impact team and you'll go and you'll come back to two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning and you'll still be in prayer for 9.30 in the morning. But now. See, what we're talking about is psychological. It's emotional. It's spiritual. where you wouldn't take overtime at work because you had church. But now, you would pray. Make sure you get to service before prayer to prepare your heart, to pray for the preacher, to pray for people you believe in God to come, to pray, amen, that God's presence will be in the service. But now, where you would give, where you would honor God with a tithe and you would do it gladly and joyfully because God loves a cheerful giver because his word says it. But now, you need to come back to Bethel. You need to return to Bethel. No longer connected in ministry where you would organize your life around the things of God, not the things of God around your life. Jesus puts it this way in the book of Revelations. He tells them, the people, he says, listen, you know what? Uh, I, I, I love all the things you're doing, but I have this one thing against you. You've left your first love. Guess who he was speaking to a church? He wasn't talking to sinners. He was talking to a church. And if the truth be told, if we're going to shame the devil and make him a lie this morning, can we be real this morning? Things are not what they used to be. They're not the same. They're not what they should be. And I know this morning, in some people's minds, many people think, you know what, it's too late for me. Uh, it's just, you know what, uh, it's just, it's, listen to me. It was 20, over 20 years, nearly 30 years, the last time this man showed up. And what happens many times, the devil will come to you and the devil will lie to you and the devil will tell you it's been too long. You've gone too far. I think about the prodigal son this morning. The prodigal son said to his dad, dad, I wish you were dead. Just give me my inheritance. It's mine anyway. He takes it and he leaves. And the Bible doesn't mince his words. He goes to a far country. He doesn't go around the corner. He wants to get as far as way from the father as he did, as he wanted. And here is a father. The father grieved when the son left home. 
home, but the father waited for the son to return back home. And when their son came back home, the father treated the son like he never left home. Listen, that makes no sense to me. That is the grace of God right there. What am I saying is it's not too late. It's not too late. If there's still breath in your body, it's not too late. Now, if we're going to get back on track to where God wants us, which is Bethel, there's some things that need to happen and found in our text. Because what we're seeing, the best way I can describe what happens to Jacob is a personal revival. He's revived personally. Listen, we pray God revive the church, but the church is not going to be revived if the people are not revived. The, the, in, listen, it, it starts with the individual. That's like, listen, when fire, if you, if, you, if, you, if you light this pulpit, it begins to burn everything. That one person gets on fire, one person gets serious, one person begins to focus on God, all of a sudden they begin to contaminate in the right word, or in fact, you got to say the right uh, word, everybody and anything around them. So if we're going to get back on track this morning to where God wants us to be, which is Bethel, three things quickly. First of all, this morning, if you're going to get back to where God wants you to be, you are going to have to leave Shechem. That's deep, isn't it? Verse one says this. God tells him, Jacob, arise. Let me tell you what the NIV version, the, new, the Nigerian International Version says this. Oh yeah? <laughs> Get up. Jacob, arise. You will never get to where God wants you until you leave where you are. And you are not going to leave where you are until you arise. What God is saying is this, Jacob, you have become too comfortable at Shechem. Things are going too well for you at Shechem. You're quite cushy. At Shechem, who remembers 2020 when the whole lockdown thing happened and all of a sudden it's like the whole world is on holiday at home? <laughs> hey, 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 come on. Can we be real? Can we be honest? It was quite nice. No rush. You know, no, you know, hey, you know, I don't have to, you know, get a, I saw this picture of this uh, a lady coming back to this, this, I think it was being a descendant, lady coming back to church, she's got rollers in her hair, you know, she's still in a, you know, a, 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 a sleeping gown, it's like a, she's so, full. I'm, I'm a homer, you know, everything's comfortable, I'm a homer, I don't have to rush, you know, I just kind of, I don't have to get up, I don't have to stand, I don't have to dress up, I don't have to get here, I, have to, I just stay at home, just, you know, just, uh, just put the, 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 what's it called, the, the online thing on, just sit there, just chillax, just hear it, I'm brushing my teeth, you know, I'm, I'm I'm still doing my work at home. I'm ironing. I'm cooking. I'm doing. I have. I just hey. And it's just so comfortable and so nice. And let's be real. It was very, very nice. And I'm telling you that as the pastors, like, oh, this precious, this car just gone. It's like, I'm in my house. I'm working from home. Maybe everyone can work from home. I can work from home as well. I'm going. I'm going to preach from home. It's perfect. It is. Not, hey, I'm, I, it was phenomenal. Like ah, but can I be real as well? There came a point when I said, you know what? This is good, but this is bad as well. Too much of this is not too good. It's like it's like it's like I, I, I'm, I'm dropping my my thing here. I'm I'm not, I'm I'm not focused. I'm not giving myself to this thing. And you know, what? there came a point where I said, you know what? Enough is enough. This has to stop. See what happens? Many of us is that we become very comfortable where we are. God, 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 you don't understand. I've got a long lease at Shechem. God, you don't understand. I've got some business at Shechem. I've got, I've got some investments at Shechem. God, you know, I'm in a relationship with this girl from Shechem, and I just can't, you know, just, you know, I know how it is, God. You know, you know how it is. You know, I, 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 I. And God says to him, arise. Listen, Jacob, God is talking here. Jacob, you've been Shechemized. You're talking all this Shechem foolishness. Get up and go. Listen, you've lived a whole chapter of your life without me. Look at the mess. Get up and go. He says, I want you to go to Bethel. I want you to dwell there. You know the problem with many people? It's like we treat Bethel like a hotel instead of a home. 
We, 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 we pass through Bethel. We, we check on Bethel. When we feel comfortable, we'll go to Bethel. We, if we can fit Bethel into our schedule, we'll fit Bethel as our schedule. But right now, it's about me, myself, and I. God didn't say, I want, you to part. I want you to dwell. I want you to stay there. I want you to leave Shechem, go to Bethel, and dwell there. And he tells them, I want you to build an altar there. I'm calling you to the altar there again. I know you built an altar on the outskirts of Shechem. I know you did this religious thing. I know you show customary. I know sometimes you drop in an offering here and there just to make yourself feel good or just to just, I'm still kind of around. But listen, I want an altar and I don't want it where you think. I don't want you to turn in your chairs because you feel comfortable. I want you to come to Bethel and build an altar at Bethel because right there is where I'm going to meet you. You're going to have to leave Shechem. The second thing is this. We're going to have to address some things at home. In chapter 2, sorry, verse 2, there's two things he says. I want to read it to you. He says, and Jacob said to his household and all who are with him, put away the foreign gods that are amongst you, purify yourselves, and change your garments. If you're going to return back on track where God wants you, First of all, this morning, he says, put away the idols that are amongst you. Do you know what a memorabilia is? Who knows what a memorabilia is? You go to a place where you like, or you go to a place where you've never experienced before. You like it, and because you liked it so much, you take a piece of it with you. And it's there to remind you of a person or or, 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 or an event or a place. Some of us we went to the impact in Japan. You took some memorabilia. Do you know we carry memorabilia with us all the time? There are things that we are taking with us that are reminding us of events, of a place, or a person. The Bible says that when Jacob left his father-in-law's place, uh, Laban's place, his wife, Rachel, took some of her father's idols and she took it with her and she hid it and she carried, amen, some of her father's idols, some of her father's gods this morning. You know what? Any God that can be stolen is not a good God. Any, any, any God that you have to carry is not worth carrying. Listen, I don't want a God that I can carry. I need a God that can carry me. <laughs> I need a God that can lift me up because sometimes I'm down. Sometimes things are not going well. Sometimes I'm in trouble and I need to be lifted up this morning. And here she is, amen. Now here he is. They're carrying all these idols, amen, with them this morning. And let me tell you something about God this morning. I mean, God this morning is a jealous God. God, don't get it twisted. He's not a God who is insecure this morning. What he does don't like, he doesn't like us giving credit to something else for which he did for us the doctor did it for me all oh, my vitamins i've been taking all my vitamins that's why i'm so healthy i've been i've been going to the gym that's my bone structure is so much better right no 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 god did that god did that and here she's they have these idols with them because he commands he, god is telling jacob this he says i want you to remove the idols from your household and everybody everybody who has it in your house here it is jacob knew that these idols were there jacob knew that his wife rachel had these idols but there came a point where jacob just started tolerating it what are you tolerating that you shouldn't be tolerating he knew all the time this was there but he does absolutely nothing. He says, put away the idols that are amongst you. Then he says, purify yourselves and change your garments. Listen to me. Internal cleansing affects external change. In other words, once there is a change on the inside, people are going to see it on the outside. One of the things that you hear a lot of discussions about. It's about uh, people's attire in the house of God. 
it's, it's, a, it's a big thing that's always been around, but it's even much more now again because of lockdown. It's big talk, you know what? How should people carry themselves as in attire in the house of God? And I'm going to tell you right now, I actually believe that your attire matters. That's my stand on it. I believe that it is it is matters. I believe that it is important. Amen. I believe, amen, that you know what you have on matters. But I'm going to say this: when it comes to new converts or anybody else, I've learned this morning that if you can get their character right, their clothes will get right too. You know, let God deal with the character. Let God deal with who you are. Some of, some of us, we're so caught up in our ego. Do you know what ego is? Ego is who you think you are. Reputation is who people think you are. Character is who God says you are. And character is what God is after. Character is what God aims at. Character is what God goes for. Character is what God wants to shape in every single one of us this morning, man. God wants us to have his character. And listen, it's not a, it's not a coincidence in the scripture. God tells us, man, don't just purify yourselves. He says, change your garments. Because you come into my house. And I know that also can be in a spiritual context. I mean, where, man, the Bible tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to put on humility, to put on kindness. I mean, there are some things, I mean, that God wants us to put on, I mean, that affects our character. And listen to me, when God deals with your character, he will, I mean, begin to affect the external as well. Lastly, we have to lead in the right direction. Jacob is the head of the home, but he has lost his authority. And in verse three, he tells his household, let us arise and go up to Bethel. And I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has seen me in the way which I have gone. He tells his family, this is what we're going to do. Family, we're going to church. Family, we're going to the house of God. And I know somebody can say, Pastor, but I live by myself. Then you need to tell yourself that. That, 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 that listen, I, I, listen, the Bible tells us David encouraged himself in the Lord. That you know, so I, I know you want to stay at home. I know you want to put your feet up, and I know you want to be comfortable this morning. But can I be real this morning? There ain't nothing wrong with you. It's one thing to be sick and sitting at home and resting. We get that. You get well soon, please. But it's another thing you just come in, there's still strength in your body, you're still life. But you know, I'm just quite comfortable at home. Everything's good, but there is church. Nah, let me just stay at home. Now you need to tell yourself we're going to church. He tells his family, guys, we're getting back on track. And here it is. He says, he says, listen, I'm going back, but I'm not going back alone. Let me say this. The promises of God are not just for us, they're for our family. You, you, I, I'm going back, but you're coming with me. I love what Joshua says. says, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. And what he says was not a suggestion. It was a command. Now, this is very important. He says, we are going to church. And guys, this is why. Let me say that again, because people need to hear this. We are going to church. And guys, this is why we're going to church. Let me tell you why I'm saying that. There has to come a time, parents, there has to come a time where it's got to be more than because I said so. They've got to know why. Because they don't want to go. <laughs> they don't find, oh, church, it's boring. They need to know why. And he tells them why. He basically says, listen, you would not be blessed today if it was not for Shechem. Your dad would not be in his right mind today if it wasn't for Shechem. 
Your parents would not be married today if it was not for Shechem. You would be one of those kids who are really relying upon, uh, what's it called, uh, 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 donations uh, even from the public uh, for food banks if it was not for Shechem. You have been, you, you've, you've, got, you've got clothes on your back, you've got a, a, a house that covers your head, you've got money in the bank, things are going well for you, and your parents are together, amen, or maybe your mother's got a mind together, or your father's got his mind together, and we're looking after you, and we try to direct you, amen, and not to you to make the mistakes that we made, we are thinking more about you than anything, and things are going well in your life, you're not like him, you don't like her, you don't like them, do you know why? Because of Shakam. Or Bethel, should I say? We need to go to Bethel. But one of the nonsense you hear from parents is, listen, I don't want to force them to go. I want them to kind of grow up and when they get older, they'll, they'll make up their minds which direction to take. Now, I want to say this to my younger kids. Because there does come an age you need to just lead them to make their own decision. But I'm talking about when they're young this morning and they're small. You know, I just need to leave them and let them make their own decisions. And when they get older, they'll make their own decisions. You know what I've learned this morning, church? It is impossible to choose from a choice that you've not been given. It's completely impossible. They, listen, here it is. They are, here they are. If you don't expose them, to Christ, if you don't expose them to the church, if you don't expose them to the brethren, if you don't expose them to preaching, if you don't expose them to Christian values, what choice do they really have? Well, I just didn't let them, you know, make their own choice. You know, the reality is, is many of us are in church today because our parents exposed us to this. Church again? Listen, I went to the services, five hour services, boring. But I was exposed to church. I was exposed to the things of God. I was exposed to the Bible. I was exposed to things. I want to close, look at on track. Now, we can hear this and think to ourselves, you know, I've tried to get back on track with God before. But nothing really happened. I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but I, you know, I've tried this. I've tried to get back on track. I've tried to, you know, me and God again, but it's like. A pastor tells a story. And this pastor tells a story uh, about his church, funny enough. And where his church was on that same road where his church was, uh, there was a car wash, uh, there was hairdressers, and there was a dry cleaners, and there's a church on the same road. Car wash, uh, hairdressers, dry cleaners, stroke laundry, and the church. And he says in all these institutions is where each one, where people going dirty, and come back out clean. That, that, that you go into the car wash, car's dirty, comes out clean. You go to the hairdressers, your hair's all matted and mash up and dusty. And by the time you come back, your hair's just glorious ladies, you know, just washed, you know, what's, I don't know what you use, but you know, you know, head and shoulders, I don't know what they're doing there, you know. Good, 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 just, you know and, and, and you come out. You go into the laundry and stroke dry cleaners and your clothes is all dirty. You get, give it, give it, and you get it back, it's all clean. Says so all of them, you go in dirty one way and you come out clean another way. All of them, except the church. Says so the church, you go in a liar, you come back out a liar. You go in a thief, you come back out a thief. You go in fornicating, you come back out still fornicate. Because what, what, what's going on? And he's, he's, he, says, he, says for, he says for a long time, he's trying to get his head around it. What, how is it? How come all these places, they're going in dirty, coming out clean, but the church? Then he says, one day it dawned on him. He says, the other three places, the reason why you were able to go in dirty and come back out clean 
is because when we went in, we did what they told us to do. Some of you ain't got that yet. You go into a car wash. Who's been going on those mechanical car washes? Even one of those ones where the guys, those guys, are, you know, like, okay, stop here. Okay, all right, run the window. Okay, all right, open the door. Okay, 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 okay. everything they tell you to do, you do it. And by because you did what you were told, your car came out another way. You go to the hairdresser and say, okay, okay, I want you to sit here. Okay, put this on. Um, all right, I'm going to turn the water on a bit. Uh, okay, close your eyes. A bit of soap is going to come. Okay, come on, move over here. All right, bring your head back a bit more. Okay, bend it. Okay, we're going to keep you here for an hour. A bit longer is going to burn. A bit the shorter is going to take it. It's not going to do its job. So it's like, and you do exactly what you're told. You take it close to the dry cleaners or to the laundry. Can you give it in? It's all mash up. All right, I'm going to take care of it. And, 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 and give it back to you. And it's nice. But the church. Come here, uh, uh, speak, can, can, can you come in something? No, I want to go sit over here because my friend's over here. I don't want to say I want to sit over there. I'm because my friend's over there. I don't want to sit over there. Because we sit over there. That's something that goes. Yeah, preaching. God says, forgive, forgive. I ain't forgiving over. I'm bombing them. I don't care. I'm gonna do it. Like and you get all this instruction, all these things. Come on, pray. Bible study. At 7 p.m., Zoom. Be on it. Uh, power prayer. Fasting tomorrow. And I ain't gonna, I'm going to eat my chicken. I don't care. I'm going to Let me go fast and pray. You see, when you listen and you do what you're told, the outcome is how you need it to be. In verse 5, the Bible says the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Here are these people, they obeyed God this morning, and the Bible says because they obeyed God, nobody touched them. Listen, once they started moving to where God wanted them to be this morning, God moved with them. And I really believe this morning, church, I don't care how wicked the world is. Once you made a decision, I'm going to serve God this morning, nothing is going to touch you. God's going to help you this morning. So all those things you're worried about, God takes care of. And I'll tell you right now, when you fear God this morning, there's no need to fear any man. God is ushering Jacob back on track. And maybe this morning, that's what he's doing right now with you. God, 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 God is, is he's reinserting himself back into your life. He's opening your eyes. He's, he's, he's dealing with your heart this morning. And maybe this morning he's speaking to you right now like he was to Jacob. And maybe for the first time in a long time, you're hearing God again. Because I'll tell you right now, sometimes our foolish decisions can mute the voice of God from our lives. Because we make some foolish choices. We make some foolish and we have the cheek and the dashes. I can't hear God. I can't hear God. I don't hear God anymore. Why am I not hearing God? Or we say something like, I think God has left me. Let me tell you something. God hasn't left you. Chances are you've left God. Chances are you've walked away from him this morning. See, you need to understand that the omniscience of God can never be interrupted. You can never go anywhere geographically. You can never go anywhere emotionally. You can never go anywhere relationally where God is not. Listen, even in your biggest mess up, God is there. Even in your biggest boo-boos, God is there. I know that because God was with Jacob in Shechem. But you say it was a godless chapter, it was. But God was there. Psalms 139 verse 8 says this, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Think about that. In the hell epitomes of your life, God is present. God is there in all his power, in all his majesty, in all his glory. See, what you need to understand is this. I'm not saying God is absent at those times. But I'll tell you something, he's not active at those times. Who remembers the prayer of Jabez? One of the things he said is, God, that your hand will be with me. One of the things he mentioned, the five things he mentioned to God, he says, God, I want your hand to be with me. I like fellowships. I've had two fellowships now in the last couple of days, just catching up with people. And, 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 
and these people we haven't seen for a while, and it's just, it's just, it's not too, it's not good when you don't, you have to connect with people again. And 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 we're together, we're talking, and you know, I'm gonna be remote, you know, all of us really are pastors. And the thing is, you've learned certain things before you became you went into ministry. One of the things that happens. Uh, when you have fellowship, church fellowships, especially, you know, a good big fe- church fellowships is that people are there. There's, there's, you know, Christians like to eat food. We don't, we don't smoke weed and drink alcohol anymore. So we have to substitute that with something. Amen. So we want some food. We like our food. So, you know, we just get our food and we yam our food and all that. Uh, and we like, we like, we like eating food. We love our food. You know, we love when people bring food and when people save us a plate and we pack a plate, we bring a Tupperware and everything's nice. We love our food. What we don't like is packing up after. We like eating the food, but it's time to clean up. You see, because, 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 you know, we've all been kind of discipled and work with, we understand that this and one, once, you know, once the food has been done, we all get together, chip in, we're all going to wash the dishes and we're all going to play our parts and get things right and et cetera and so forth. But before, back in the day, when you're just in church and you just, and people eat and grabbing food, but it's time to clear up. It's not like everyone gets, you know, nobody wants to clear up. And sometimes, you know, you go to a place and, and in the stuff you have to move and maybe it's a big table or a big apparatus you need to get out of the way or put into the place. And, and here you are, you're struggling. And, and man, you're trying to move this thing and God help us. I mean, if it's the ladies who are doing the ones trying to move the things and, and carry it and the man them are just kind of there and just kind of watching and just got to hurry up the food, you know? That? And, 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 you know, you try to move these things and you try to, and here it is, there, there are people around there. There are people present, but not everyone's active. No one ever was helping. Listen, when I'm moving something big, I don't need your moral support. <laughs> I mean, listen, when I'm like, listen, this can be big sometimes. You know, I can lift it up. I can, you know. It's easier. The Bible says two are better than one. You know, one better than another. You know, here you are. You're trying to move this thing. You know, I don't, I don't need someone coming to me and say, hey, Pastor, you know what? I'm praying for you that God's going to help you carry that over there. Listen, God's going to strengthen your back, the anointing right now. Touch him in Jesus' name. The strength that he can listen, bro. Right? Or sis. But bro, I don't need your prayers. What I need you to do is give me a listen. I know God is with me when I sing. I know God is with me when I pray. I know God is with me when I'm down. I know God is with me when I'm going through difficult times. I know God is with me when I'm sick this morning. God is active but God what I need is for you amen is to be active in my life that's why he said he said God that your hand will be with me so God was there in chapter 34 but God was not active what a shame this morning that God who has done absolutely nothing wrong has to do the one who has to be the one who's chasing us when we should be the one chasing him. I want to close quick look at this time to get back on track because it really is. In verse six and verse seven, the Bible says, so Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people who are with him Verse 7, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. He comes to this place. The first time he comes there, he calls it Bethel. But everyone around there was calling the place Luz. He calls the place, he, he, he wakes up, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. And I did not know. And he says, you know what, this is Bethel, which is, this is the house of God. But where he was, was called Luz. Luz means house of almond nuts. That's what it means. House of almond nuts. He gets back there. He says, oh, I'm in Bethel. But everyone is still calling the place Lods. Oh, I'm in church. But everyone is still calling the place nuts. Do you know the world thinks we're nuts? Do you know that? Why would you believe in a God 
that you can't see. You're nuts. Well, why would you believe in a virus you can't see? Well, you know, the Bible tells us that you can't see the wind. In fact, Jesus says you can't see the wind, or you can see the effects of the wind. Well, we can see how it affects us. But we, we, listen, this thing has been, God has been affecting us long before any COVID-19. God has been affecting lives long before that. God has been changing men and women long before that. Well, you, you, you're nuts giving your time, giving your talent, giving your treasure to God. The world thinks you and I are completely off our tracks. That we've lost it. And the truth this morning, church, is we were nuts. But now we're saved. <laughs> we had lost it before. But now we're right with God. See, that whole area, Luz, the reason it's called the house of almond nuts was because it was covered with nuts. It's like the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is called the Mount of Olives because it's a mountain covered with olives. So the reason Lods is called Lods is because it is a place that is covered with nuts. There were nuts everywhere. So when Jacob comes there, he called it the house of God. But here it is this morning, church. Nuts were still everywhere. Let me say something this morning. When you come to this church, there are still some nuts. If I was caught in this place, you want you want you're a nutter. There's still some men and women this morning. Whether you look good or not, you are nuts. But even with all the nuts, God is still here. Even all our madness, and, and I don't know about you, but I still haven't got it all together yet. My life is still not perfect. Even in all my imperfections and my issues and my problems, God is still here. God is still with me. He gets there, and guess what? God was there. And he says, I'm not going to call the place Bethel anymore. I'm going to call the place El Bethel, which literally means God of Bethel. In other words, I went to the house of God before, but now I'm going to the God of the house. And church, this morning, listen, if you will come back on track, if you will begin to redo the things you used to do before, if you begin to keep and obey the word of God, if you begin to come back to the altar again and not just turn in your seats, but God, I'm going to come back uh, amen, to what you've challenged me and what you've spoken to me about. I want to make you a promise uh, like you did for Jacob this morning. If you will come back, God will meet with you there. He will. He's a faithful God this morning. And he's looking at precious men and women with powerful destiny, powerful purpose this morning, and his heart and his, 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 his will is to bring you back on track. So what he did for Jacob, he can do for you. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Amen. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. God wants to get us back on track again. I so thank God for the Bible. I so thank God it was written by men inspired by the Spirit of God. They didn't hide their faults. They didn't hide their issues. They didn't hide their sins. There were people who got off track but got right back on track with God again. And tonight, maybe you're, this morning, maybe you're here and you're off track. And what I mean, first of all, is you're not right with God. You haven't given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I let you know right now, my friend, Jesus Christ is coming back. And he's not coming back for schools. He's not coming back for hospitals. He's not coming back for good people. He's not coming back because you voted Labour or you voted Conservative this morning. He's not coming back because you're pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine. Listen, he's coming back for one thing and one thing alone, and that is the church. 
And the only way you become part of the church this morning is you need to know the head of the church and his name is Jesus Christ. Our world is a mess. It's not getting better. It's not going to get better. The spiraling out of control has begun. And it's time to make a decision. Are you going to be on the Lord's side or not? Very quickly, under the sound of my voice, you say, Pastor, I'm all right with God. You know, I'm off track. I've been doing my own thing. I've been living my own life. I've been going my own way. Um, you know, but this morning, the spirit of God has dealt with me. Um, you know, I need to give my life to Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, I need to put my faith in God. I've been putting my faith in men. Uh, I've been putting my faith in money. I've been putting my faith in my know-how. Uh, but this morning, I know, I know, that I know that my faith needs to belong to Jesus. Uh, and if that's you this morning, you're not right with God and you want to give your, your life to Christ. If that's you, why don't you do one thing? Just lift your hand up. Up, lift it up and say, here's my hand. I want to pray and receive Christ. That Here's my hand. I want to pray. I want to get right with God. Here's my hand. Jesus, when you come back, I want to go with you. I don't want to be left behind. If that's you, come and slip your hand up and put it down this morning. I want to pray with you very quickly. Very quickly. Slip it up and put it down this morning. Maybe this morning you've backslid. You're away from God. Backslide and stop making excuses. Stop making excuses for your delay to return back to Bethel. Because you, I, have, I have no doubt you've already lost a lot, but you're going to lose a lot more than you've already lost already if you keep on excusing why you cannot come back to Bethel. Will you come back to Bethel this morning? Will you humble yourself and say, I've been away like Jacob. I've, been, I've, I've, I've taken detours and U-turns and gone away and done my own thing and things were okay for a period of time. But now, I'm right now in the chapter 34 of my life. There is no God. I've made decisions and I may have prospered, but my family's a mess. My, 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 my social life is a mess. My heart is a mess. My children is a mess. I'm a mess. Oh, how far cry I've gone away from God when I was sensitive and open to him. And I would allow him to lead me and direct me and show me things but now I'm just going on my own and things are not getting better and I know, I know, I know the reason why is because God spoke to me from back when to return back to him and I made excuses and I tried to battle with God and I made all this chop and change and nothing seemed to change, fix things and I just need to humble myself and I need to just obey what God says and come back home if that's you this morning, you've backslid. It's time for you to recommit your life again. If that's you, come on, lift your hand up. Say, it's my hand. I want to recommit my life. I want to get right with God. I'm away. I've slipped. I've drifted. Quickly. Then I want to speak to God's people this morning. Do you remember when you were in Bethel? Do you remember you were content with letting the stone be your pillow. Do you know, you remember you were just content with just being accepted and, and loved and, 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 and encouraged. You, you, you were just content with that, that they would choose me to be involved in this mystery, ministry. You, you were so joyous that God, I can actually give back to you, give back something to you. Listen, I always remember when I got a job and, and I said, you know what, uh, God has blessed me with this job. I'm just going to begin to tithe and honor God. And friend, I never ever forgot that. I was just so grateful uh, that God, you blessed me with this. How dare I withhold from you and I would honor him and I would give him and that has never changed. Amen. In 27 years right now, that has not changed. And this morning, I want to challenge you right now, this morning. Maybe God is speaking to you, amen, about things. God is speaking to you about that, amen, uh, uh, things he's dealt with you about in the past. Amen. And, you know, I'm going to be in prayer. You know what? I'm going to be involved in the house of God. I'm going to use the talents that he's given me for the kingdom and for his glory. You know, maybe I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, and you started doing those things, but now you've backed away. Now you don't do them anymore. Paul tells the church of Galatia, you ran well. Who hindered you? Tottenham, you ran well. Is somebody hindering you? Is something hindering you? Have we so got caught up in the blessing that we forgot the bless all? Do we still believe it is important to be in the house of God? Or have now over time at work become more important to us. And I'm not saying don't do over time when you can do it, but listen to me, clashes with God. God has to win all the time. Mm -hmm. 
Back in the day, we would fight to be in conference. Today, we can't even spell conference. It's time to come back to Bethel. It's time to return back to our first love.